And my name is Linda Alela. It's time for Morning Cafe, that morning program that kickstarts your day every other time that you're tuned into TV 47. And uh, you know, our main aim is to ensure that you stick around all day, all through. So welcome on board. Hashtag Morning Cafe at Linda underscore Alela. TV 47K is how you can get to interact with us. Be part and puzzle of this session up until 9 a.m. And we'll gladly get to sample some of your comments as we proceed with the show. So today, we have a whole of activities lined up for you as we take a look at the newspapers. We have a comprehensive talk on the current affairs or the issues that are taking center stage in the world of news. And importantly, later on, we discuss matters mental health. Over the time... Since that time when the pandemic started, most of the people have gone into that state of despair because of the difficulties that have come along with that, the differences, the adjustments that their lives have gone through. And today we term it necessary to discuss this. We have people who've gone through the same experience and they share their experiences and tell us how best they've been able to manage that. So indeed, it's going to be a great show and I'd love that you are part of it. If you're going through something, please feel free to drop your comments and we'll be having answers, we'll be having a conversation revolving around that and we all get solutions towards this. But importantly, we first of all take a look at what my team has prepared in terms of a news and to kick start the session counties are likely to use the second generation formula in sharing the 316.5 billion shillings this was resolved after a meeting between president uhuru kenyatta and the senate's leadership council of governors and odm boss raila odinga in state house and as elizabeth mutuko now reports the national government has committed an additional 54 million depending on the economic performance on behalf of Kajado delegation, I vote no. After three months of back and forth on revenue formula standoff, and President Uru Kenyatta convened the first meeting to deliberate the matter. The meeting comprising of ODM leader Raila Odinga, Senate leadership and the Council of Governors agreed to have counties retain the second generation formula in the current financial year and use the disputed third generation formula in the next financial year. The government has further committed an additional 54 billion shillings to the devolved units but the monies will be availed in the financial year 2021-2022. I put the question which is at the house now at Jones. As men of that opinion say aye. aye. As men of a contrary you say nay. The eyes have it. During the afternoon session, Majority Leader Samuel Pogisio sought an adjournment for an informal meeting known as Kamukunchi. Senators are said to have reached a consensus to task the 12th member committee to come up with a formula which will see all the counties get a fair share without any county losing, as it was proposed by the Commission on Revenue Allocation. They asked us, challenged us, Mr. Speaker, to go and meet with the executive and to be able, Mr. Speaker, to see if some extra monies can be given to add to what has been given so that we can now formulate afresh how to uh, dis uh, divide this money among counties. And so, Mr. Speaker, it is not, it's just for us to go and get that report back because this happened and we have a report to give. And so I do not want to belabor the point that we will, uh, we will then move into a session where we can, you allow us to move into a session where we can informally discuss this matter. So, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move and again ask uh, Minority Leader, leader to uh, second. Thank you. The 12th member committee will have one week to deliberate the way forward before coming up with the report which will be presented to Akamukunchi on Monday. Elizabeth Mutuko, TV 47 Nairobi. You also don't laugh. And the Garissa governor, Ali Kourani, uh, was released on a 3.25 million shillings cash bail after denying all the graft charges leveled against him at the Milimani Law Court. Kourani has, however, been barred from accessing county offices unless accompanied by an EACC official, uh, David Mutuka, with the details. <laughs> Garissa Governor Ali Korane was released on a 3.25 million shillings cash bail on Tuesday. 
Korane and four co-accused denied all counts of economic crime leveled against them following alleged misappropriation of 233 million shillings World Bank grant under the Kenya Urban Support Program. The four co-accused among them Garissa County Finance Chief Officer Ibrahim Noor, Treasury Head Mohamed Abdullahi, Municipality CEC Abdi Shale, and Head of Accounting at the Municipal, Hamed Aden, have also been slapped with a 1.2 million shillings cash bail each. Their trial at the Milimani Law Courts is set to resume on 23rd October. Korane and the four co-accused county staff have also been barred from accessing office unless accompanied by a detective from the EACC. Accused one to a cash bill of Kenya shillings 3,250,000 or a bond of Kenya shillings 5 million with one surety of similar amount. Accused two, three, four, five, and six to a cash bill of 1,200,000 or a bond of Kenya shillings 3 million with one surety of similar amount. All accused are here by bird from the offices, only allowed to visit while accompanied by an officer from the EACC. According to EACC, the 233 million shillings World Bank grant was channeled through the National Treasury to the Garissa County government, thereafter to the Garissa Municipal Board and subsequently to accounts of individuals associated with the governor. Korane becomes the sixth governor facing fraud charges to be barred from accessing office after Tharaka Nithi Governor Mudominjuki, former Kiambu Governor Ferdinand Ndongo Waititu, Samburu Governor Moses Lenol Kulal, Nairobi Governor Mike Mbuvi Sonko, and Migori Governor Okoth Obado. Garissa Governor Ali Korane now joins what is fast becoming a long list of governors in the country facing graft charges in courts to be barred from accessing office with his next mention set for October. David Mutoka, TV 47 at Milimani Locots, Nairobi. The Auditor General, Anansi Gadung, was put to task to explain why her office is yet to release an audit report on how the COVID-19 funds allocated to KEMSA were utilized in purchasing and supply of PPEs. The Auditor General, however, defended her office from the delays causing uh, cost uh, saying that she has a huge backlog of reports yet to be audited since assuming office and as Eli Lugova reports the 21 days ultimatum issued by uh, to the investigating agencies by President Uhuru Kenyatta to complete probe into the misuse of COVID-19 billion lapses today. Appearing before the Senate's Committee on Health and Ad hoc Committee on COVID-19, the Auditor General defended her office on grounds of the special audit report being in the initial stages of data collection and analysis from various institutions, including the Office of Control of Budget, National Treasury, Ministry of Health, among others. The Auditor General is expected to present an audit report from all the first seven counties on how COVID-19 funds were utilized. Let's talk about KEMSA, right from the beginning of the procurement process to the end of the procurement process, when the goods got into the warehouse of KEMSA. Those are the processes that we really want the preliminary report very urgently, right now. So we agree as members that we are talking about KEMSA specifically. Uh, we will carve out uh, the, KEMSA, uh, the KEMSA component of the report and uh, fast track it. I also don't, uh, uh, don't again go off uh, on a different uh, tangent because I have to follow my standards, I have to follow my, my, my audit process. The Senate Ad Hoc Committee has given the Auditor General Nancy Gatungu up to 30 September to present a preliminary report on utilization of COVID-19 funds allocated to KEMSA for the procurement of PPEs. This is even as the Office of Auditor General expected to release a comprehensive audit report on the accounts of KEMSA for the financial years 2017-2018 to 2019-2020. What I said is that the teams will have finished doing the preliminary corroboration and analysis of data so that they know exactly what it is they need to go look for in the counties. Now, what I'm going to do is delay that and get them to concentrate more on this particular request uh, that you're now, uh, or the scope that uh, you have now uh, given me. The Auditor General's appearance before the Senate Committee on Health and the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 comes as the 21-day ultimatum by President Uru Kenyatta for investigations into the Kemsa saga elapsed on Wednesday. Eli Logova, TV47. 
And the Ministry of Health has refuted claims that the COVID-19 curve has flattened in the country. The ministry says that such claims are not only false but dangerous as they risk occurrence of a surge in the country. This even as 10 more people succumbed to the virus in the last 24 hours, that is as of yesterday's address. Zainab Mohammed with the details. The Ministry of Health has refuted claims that the COVID-19 curve has flattened in the country due to the dropping numbers recorded in the past few days. According to the ministry, necessary precautionary measures need to be taken in order to contain the virus from spreading further. Hands on, remembering that this virus has established community transmission, it would mean that yes indeed we are at that point of inflection that was intimated by His Excellency the President. And what we are saying is that these gains, and we do insist that there are gains that have been made, these gains can be reversed if we do not continue to adhere to these measures. The curve is not flat. What we are seeing are uh, reporting fewer numbers. And we have not stopped at telling you, yes, we understand that our testing is at, a, at an all-time low. And see this because of the global supply chain challenges we are facing with testing kits. So let those numbers that we report yesterday of 48 and 396 give an indication of a flattening curve. The ministry further warned Kenyans on the occurrence of a second wave of the virus, saying that Kenyans are not ready to deal with the effects of a second wave. Today, uh, one of the papers carrying a whole page saying that the worst of COVID-19 is over. Wherever they go that from is not from the ministry, I can assure you. So this, that's really the message that should be carried from the further state here. What should be telling Kenyans is that Kenyans are not ready for a second wave, now that we are not even let out the first wave. This is as the number of COVID-19 cases rose to 36,301 cases after 96 more people tested positive for the virus in the last 24 hours. 121 people have recovered as 10 more people succumbed to the virus. Zainab Mohammed, TV47. And still on matters health, Nairobi County nurses have officially begun their strike after the lapse of the 14 days strike notice. According to the nurses, Nairobi Metropolitan Service, uh, NMS, has failed to negotiate and meet their demands even after issuing a 14 days notice. The health workers have, among others, complained of the poor working conditions, lack of personal protective equipment, stagnation, and not being paid their salaries or allowances as promised by the president. Stagnations, number two, resignations, number three, confirmation letters, number four, we have uh, right placement and um, NHIF or comprehensive health cover. As health workers of Nairobi, we are saying that we won't go back to work until our demands are met. What NMS is doing is trying to buy time and we shall not buy into their jokes. We are very serious people. We gave them a strike notice for two, two weeks. They never called us. If they were serious, they wanted us to sit and negotiate. They could have called us for those two, two weeks. Out because of uh, very critical grievances that we addressed on uh, 26th of August that uh, the employer has not been able to address. First of all, we were given promotion, a section of other people were given promotions and others were denied. We are asking for those promotions, for those who are left out, particularly for those who are left out to be given. And then number two, even those promotions that were given, we do not have arrears. We are also asking that those arrears must be tabulated right from January to date because the agreement that we have is that the arrears were to be tabulated from January to July. 
Deputy President William Ruto has told off his arch-rival, ODM leader Raila Odinga, after his criticism on Ruto's controversial church contributions and philanthropic ways. Ruto's allies have also urged him on insisting that he believes in God is the winning card in his 2022 presidential race. President William Ruto has once again told off his opponent, saying he will not be cowed by threats and intimidation. Speaking at his current home on Tuesday during a prayer meeting attended by Naro County religious and political leaders, the DP said his resolve for the 2022 presidential bid is intact. Threats, blackmail and intimidation is the language of cowards and conmen and people who have, who don't believe in democracy. DP Ruto also threw a salvo at ODM leader Raila Odinga, who over the weekend criticized the DP's philanthropy and believe in the Bible. Ruto's allies present at the prayer meeting Tuesday urging him on. <laughs> So your excellency, you keep walking, do not throw stones back at these barking dogs, let them keep barking, you keep walking and with the support and the prayers of these men and women of God, you shall get to where you're going. Usimjibu mpumbavu ki mpumbavu, usijo kafanana na ye. Kwa hivyo yu excellency, usiwajibu wa mpumbavu ki mpumbavu. On several occasions, Raila Odinga has castigated Ruto over church contributions, but the latter insists he is not relenting. Nancy Kimuyu, TV47. Thanks, Nancy, for that. So, proprietors and business owners that have been running the Luna Park situated in Nairobi City for 10 years now have been served with a 24-hour notice to the Kate. This follows the ongoing construction of the 18-kilometer express road that is set to run from Jomo Kenyatta International Airport to James Gishuru Road. Traders have expressed their words asking for more time to allow them vacate as the Noklorin now reports. Proprietors and business owners in Luna Park in Nairobi are now living in fear after receiving a 24-hour notice to vacate and shut down their businesses. I want to drive in a good road, but let them consider us. Let them consider us. You can't wake up and shut somebody's business all of a sudden within hours. You can't. This is due to the construction of the express road from Jomo Kenyatta International Airport to James Gishuru Road that is approximately 18 kilometers. When you come, you do, just don't tell people to move out because even the road can never be made in one day, isn't it? And then also the road has been in the map for a long time. So somebody somewhere did not do his work, isn't it? Because you need to have, uh, to have alerted people to give uh, notice in appropriate time and give them enough time to move out because you can't move these machines, you can't move all the business businesses here within one day. This comes after President Ru Kenyatta toured the park on Thursday last week in search of different options, plans to which its efforts bore no fruits. We had uh, a rare visit by the, His Excellency the President here on Thursday and uh, where he was taken uh, through the different options available for the Nairobi Expressway. But uh, what we like to appeal to the president and his team, that beyond development, there is also humanity or people who also earn their living uh, out of this particular location. As the premises is expected to pave way for public transport vehicles, proprietors say they are on the road to incurring a loss amounting to 400 million shillings. In terms of the machines and the, the, the layouts you can see, <clears throat> it's about 400 million. And then uh, the other investments, because you can see there are businesses all over. Those businesses, they're also estimating almost a similar amount of money. I took a loan of over a million. That's my restaurant. I renovated it to the standard the CS wanted. How will I pay that loan? How? 
Luna Park business owners are now asking for more time to vacate their belongings, saying it is humanly impossible to do so in less than 24 hours. Let them give us time just to remove our things or I know we cannot refuse. Let them not come and flatten our things. Just give us time. We remove our things. Come sit down with us. We talk. Now, it is a total shock to business owners here at Luna Park in Nairobi who are expected to look for alternative ways of survival as when the dawn strikes tomorrow, Luna Park will be no more. Nanok Loren, TV 47. Away from that, our family in Nyahura village, Kangema in Muranga County, is mourning the death of five of its members who perished in a grisly road accident Sunday evening along the Wote Makweni Highway. The five among them, a husband, wife and their daughter, had gone to visit their in-laws in Machakos and were involved in the accident on their way back home. The family has appealed to well wishes to help them transport the bodies of the deceased back to Muranga County. Tulianda vizuri, kurudi ndio lileta shida. Gari likutana na gari ingine ya white. Na gari yetu ilikuwa na speed na yungine ilikuwa na speed. Zika wabatekiana, mboja yetu ikakata anzia. Ikabingiritika. Mtu wakanza kurushwa, uye alirushwa. Na mi nikarushwa mtu wapili. Mi kutoka kwa gari, gari ilikuwa ina rotate. But mtu mboja tundu walikuwa hamelala hapo. Nilimuita, haku itika. Mi kwa muka, nilikuwa na jisikia. But ni, si kuwa nasikia mwili kiwa na uchungu nini, but ni kustuka. Juu nilikuwa na katotoka dogo, ni kakatupa na uko, sujika lienda aje, but nyuma nilirudi kukuta, akana shida, hako ndo kalibaki katika watu wote, watu watano, wakakufa. Watu ema, watu wa mungu, watu saidie kwa sababu hiyo mirimitano bado imerashua. Uko makuyu, makuyuni mochari ina atakika na ifanywe postimutem na tunataka transport dio tuarete moranga mochari tukijitayalisa na masishi uh, watu watano si rahisi kwa sababu tunataka jenesa tunataka galisa kufsakiri samwili kwa hivyo tunaomba watu wa samaria wema na watu wetu wakubwa wetu wenye wametusimamia esa moranga county tunaomba wasimame na sisi Residents of Emu Kaya village in Navaholo constituency are in mourning after a man hacked his wife to death using a djembe following domestic quarrel. According to the neighbors, the man was drunk and demanded a meal of Ugali, sparking off the deadly feud. Area leaders are now calling on the government to help with counseling services to alleviate the rise in social vice of domestic violence in the area. <laughs> nikasikia mara ya kwanza baba alitoka nje kurudi kwa nyumba akaingia akaenda mpaka kwa bedroom kutoka tena akarudi nje na hiyo saa alikuwa anaitisha nataka ugali tukamwambia ushakula ugali kitamu akaanza kucheza cheza tu tukamuuliza baba leo umekuaje ye yeah, akasema tu ye yeah, anacheza akaenda tena kwa nyumba tena akatoka nje bila rudi akafunga mlango ya bedroom tukasikia tu kitu kama inakonga pa bila nilitoka nikasikia mama anafungua mlango ya bedroom mama akatoka alikuwa anataka kutoka nje na kianguka hapo mpaka kwa viti hapo ndani alikuwa amelewa na akaja akapewa chakula ili akasema hajakula na hali amekula kwa hivyo nafikiri ni hiyo hiyo imechangia mpaka kifo chake kimefanya nini kimepatikana kwa hivyo sisi kama familia tumehuzunika na tunaomba pia serikali ifanye nini ichukue mkondo wake. Tunahusunika sana. Na kulingana na vile aliwaua tumetaka familia. Sisi kama familia tumetaka peane ngombe kulingana na kwa kimila yetu. Na yabiri sisi kama familia ya makunjio tunasunika na tunataka apeane shilingi 50 kwa familia. Oh, 
pretty much unfortunate. And now the county government of Belgero Marakret has fired the, the contractor of the Kamarini Stadium. The committee that oversees the county's government projects fired the contractor after failing to complete the stadium on a time. The contractor had promised to complete the construction of the stadium by September but failed to do so. Stephen Kitror reports. The committee that oversees project by the county government of Elgeo Marakwet, a fire contractor by the name for non-construction after failure to complete the Kimarini Stadium on time. We are really baffled by the slow progress being made by Funan Construction that is in charge of the contract at Kamani Stadium. We are not at all happy based on our progress uh, evaluation after every one month or two. And based on visits by cars from Nairobi Sports, Minnesota Sports, and based on the promise given by Funan Construction, we are convinced that this project, the contractor, has to be terminated. The contract has to be net terminated. The contractor is said to have committed to complete the construction of the stadium by September, but recent inspection of the stadium by the committee established the contractor has not been on site for a very long time, noting the stadium is only 30% done. I think the last time he was on site, we don't even know. He has not been on site for a long time. The last time uh, his agent was with Kas Hassan Nur is that he promised that by September the project will be complete. Yet we know even today it is only 30% complete. The remaining works are so massive, 70% will not be completed in a month's time. According to the chair of Elio Marako Delivery Committee, Dr. Omar Hamed, the entire project is estimated to cost 281 million shillings, but only 31 million shillings has been paid due to slow progress of the construction. The project itself is 281 million, about only 31 million has, has been paid uh, because of the kind of, of work, the slowness of the work uh, that uh, is, is going on. What he has on site is a simple skeletal staff that is not able to carry out any meaningful work. He doesn't have any materials on site. And if you go there, there's simply no coordination of any activity. Omar has now declared the position vacant for more competitive contractors who are capable of finishing the remaining work in a stipulated duration of time. We've decided that this work has to be stopped for an construction. The contract has to be terminated so that we're able to get another contractor who will be able to do one who has the capacity to finish the remaining works in a stipulated period of time. That is that has been the decision. Steve Veniki Prop, TV 47 Sports. Let's now take you for that short break and we're coming back with the newspapers.
And we're back with the newspaper as Kevin Obegi, policy advocate, is joining us this morning alongside Frank Anyona, who's a political analyst, as we take a look at what has been captured in the newspapers. We have the People Daily and the Daily Nation. And to kickstart with the People Daily, the front page, and universities ready waiting for green light to reopen. There's a story that has been captured on page nine of the People Daily, still begging the question as to how ready we are as a country to reopen. The other day, that meeting by CS Magoha uh, convened towards charting the way forward on how the stakeholders are going to address the, you know, ways of how we can proceed to reopen our schools and have our students back to school. That should be uh, giving a report by the end of the week and in regards to whether indeed we are set or not. So this story that has been captured on page 9 of the People Daily expounds some more on how ready the universities, the you know technical institutes, could be ready to proceed and reopen. This amid the numbers that have been recorded right there, 96 recorded positive cases. Uh, that is as of yesterday's address. And from samples of 3,270 tests that were taken, and recovered patients so far, 23,364 recovered people and 634 deaths. And um, this also uh, come bringing in the question of what the Ministry of Education said yesterday, that the curve is not at that point where we can say that it has flattened. So coming to you, gentlemen, on the school reopening matter it's been a hula baloo we've been treated to lots of different you know questions and uh, lots of different uh, you know directions coming from the ministry of education what do you expect moving on what is this uh, you know that uh, the stakeholders will deliberate on and what are the likelihoods that we're going to have our universities back and running maybe to start with you anyona uh, thank you very much this morning, Linda. Uh, first of all, I'm even surprised that uh, we are having uh, such kind of debate on universities being reopened. I thought that uh, higher learning institutions in this country should be able to deal with uh, situations or issues in a different way, the way secondary schools and primary schools handle the issues. It is a shame that our vice chancellors and uh, heads of institutions institutions in various universities cannot devise means, yet other international institutions are continuing with their studies. If you go, for example, with the University of Nairobi, which has been on, and uh, they've been uh, supplying their students with bundles and trying to uh, continue with learning. So it's a very bad habit when you see heads of higher, higher institutions in other countries have uh, developed uh, different means of dealing with the different patent, uh, pandemics and issues. So when you realize that uh, our institutions cannot even, are just relying on uh, government directives, they cannot devise uh, modern means that are going to assist to, uh, the students to, to, I mean, to continue their education amid the pandemic, then it means that our education system is in a big mess. We don't have leaders in the higher institutions who can think outside the box. We need uh, 21st century leaders with 21st century solutions. Mm. I thought that these issues were only in the political space, but I'm really surprised that uh, if that is the direction our learning institutions are taking, and I'm actually shocked that they, are not, they have not been continuing with the learning process. Uh, for instance, the higher education, the, the, the higher institutions should even be able to come up with uh, uh, online platforms and uh, continue with the learning. It's not really something that should be able to, to should, should be affecting us as a country. Where we are headed, this is a 2020, I mean, and technology should be high. So when you realize that uh, higher institutions in Kenya are being closed because of uh, some pandemic here and uh, political rallies are being done. Then I think, Linda, it's a big problem that should be addressed. And I, I'm, I'm insisting that the problem is with, not with the Ministry of Education. We cannot be given jobs and wait to be spoon-fed 
uh, on uh, every other thing. Mm -hmm. let's, let's play the devil's if, advocate. If, uh, let's play the devil's advocate yes. and probably argue, as many would have argued, that you know this is a, some pandemic that got people flat-footed. And every other person is trying to figure out what next. So same applies to what has been happening within the Ministry of Education. And while they would have the interest of having the children back, they also put to consideration the aspect of health, which is uh, crucial. So looking in, uh, Kevin Obegi, what do you make of what we've been treated to? And do you suppose that uh, the fact that our students are still back at home is one thing that is justified based on the situation at hand? Okay, thank you, Linda. I think we have a very big problem, and I'll agree with uh, Mr. Nyona. We've been back and forth on this same issue, and it is a pity to understand that we still have the higher level education institutions still closed. There's a reason why they're called higher level. You know, to, to it, take it this way. We have, uh, in the education sector, we have teachers who are being molded in the universities to come and build the secondary schools, you know, like mold these students from primary to secondary and then they advance them to another level. So if at all they cannot reach solutions at that higher level, then it means we're still lagging behind. Actually, for me, I would say we're still in the colonial way, yeah? So we're actually depending on other people from outside the country to put things on our, on our table so that we can you know, like digest them or rather than ingest them in our bodies. It's like we are, we are being given. We are, not just, we are not doing anything for ourselves, you know. So Magawa has been waking up on a day they will say October, another day they will say, no, we wait till January 2021. So where are we really headed? Mm -hmm. Is the problem coming in from the aspect of the advisors that he has or other pressures from the government uh, institutions so you cannot really tell so we are actually even as parents we are led to like wait on something that's not there on decisions that are not fully are uh, you know going to be in place on time and as time goes by we are looking at an aspect of where our young people who are supposed to be in school are not attending classes. We have the aspect of the online, and I like the fact that other institutions, higher level institutions, are actually giving away bundles for their students to continue learning online. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't depend where you are, but you're still taking your classes. Mm -hmm. So I think we, st we still have a long way to go. Yeah. But, but, but just how many people are able to, you know, effectively have their online classes? I mean, we talk as if we do not look at the situation and the discrepancies that we've witnessed today. It's been hard. It's been hard for students back at home to access the internet, to have the devices that can help them go through the online studies, to even, you know, have television sites back in the bundles to go through these sessions as we wind up on that one. Uh, I think... Uh For me, I, I feel, you know, like even in the community villages, mm -hmm. we have social computer centers that the education system can utilize for individuals who don't have smartphones, who can't access internet and things like that. These things are there. We cannot run away from the fact that, yes, we, we know not everyone can access, uh, afford maybe a smartphone, uh, but we have these centers that can be utilized by the education sector, mm -hmm. sector, and this is something that should be assessed, uh, you know, from the uh, ministry level up to the grassroots level. So it's something that is doable, you know. All right. Well. Actually, actually, to add, mm -hmm. to add something on Briefly. top of that, uh, you you don't you don't need to own a, a smartphone or a computer so that you can access online classes. If the online classes are there, students uh, must go to cyber cafes and uh, maybe if you say the, 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 the amount, you know, the economy is not good. But uh, I've seen uh, the online classes, the way they operate. It is something that you can go and check your weekly coverage and handle it the entire week. Do you realize, so, do you Linda, realize I, that there are people who stay you know, back in the rural areas and uh, you probably would need to go miles and miles away or, you know, kilometers and kilometers away to, you know, get at least a cyber cafe open somewhere. Honestly, well, anyway, let's not uh, debate on that. I think, yes, in a way it's achievable and equally, you know, brings on board 
uh, you know, the need for us to proceed and work on the internet connection and even how best we can expound on technology to see our students uh, get such advantages. But that aside, and uh, in this story that has been captured, we say that uh, the Ministry of, of Health says that, uh, not yet Uhuru, I don't want to say not yet Uhuru, but yes, we are not there just yet. I made these talks of the fact that, you know what, people have argued that, you know, it is at that point where now the, flat, the curve is officially, you know, flattened. And uh, maybe it's a time that as a country, we go back to normalcy. Kevin. Uh, I think uh, the Ministry of Health has done uh, quite much to ensure that uh, the curve is flattened. But, you know, over time we've heard, even from cases from, uh, in other countries, that once there's laxity, then people tend to, you know, relax. And maybe the, me the specific measures that have been put in place to ensure that the, the spread of the virus itself is mitigated. Uh, so people tend to, like, you know, you will leave your mask at home. And, you know, as, even as, a, as, a, as human beings, we will be relaxant. Eh? And then uh, maybe we'll be ignorant to some uh, extent. But I think uh, the, up to this very point, we are not yet there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we still need to ensure that if at all, like now we look at the education sector, our children will be going to school. Are they still maintaining social distance in school? Are they still wearing masks? For those uh, young people who are above the stipulated age, you know, that they, they can breathe easily when they're on the mask, and, you know, other specific aspects. So we cannot say that uh, we really there. We still have a, a, a journey, you know, to progress on. All right, and uh, well, as we drop that one and pick a different story altogether, members of parliament sue over Badi's cabinet position. This is a story that has been captured on page five of the People as Daily and crossing over to it. Um, member of parliament in court to bar Badi from cabinet meets. Uh, this is um, Honorable. Um, yes, I don't know. Kandara Member of Parliament, that is Alice Wahome, who declares that this is not right. This is upon that point where Badi took an oath of secrecy on September the 10th in State House when all these other cabinet secretaries had been brought on board by President Uhuru Kenyatta, you know, to chart the way forward on a progress in the country. And also, still, uh, in as much as may we have lauded what NMS has been doing in Nairobi equally. There are other leaders who argued that, in a way, NMS and, of course, the differences that they still witness with the likes of the governor's office, that is Governor Mike Sonko, are still also, in a way, derailing activities and making it even tougher uh, for, you know, the country to be able to restore the glory of the capital city. And, you know, what do you make of that? Uh, with the due respect, uh, Linda, I think the president is killing uh, democracy and is killing is uh, is uh, is uh, like uh, demeaning the will of the people. Because I mean, if people went to the ballot and voted for Mike Sonko, you should be able to leave him uh, to complete his term without any interference. Mm -hmm. If in any case, if Badi wanted to offer assistance per se, he could be fixed under Sonko's government. Mm -hmm. He could be an advisor. He could uh, be placed somewhere to run things, but it's clear that even a primary kid would see the president doesn't need certain governors who probably are not aligned to him. And this is a very bad president that should not be allowed by uh, the court systems or anything. I'm glad that uh, the legislature, Alice Wahome, has gone to court to, uh, to represent the Nairobians. And it's a shame that uh, Nairobi that has even a woman rep and a senator, they are not even speaking. Alice Wahome is a lady, regardless of uh, whoever uh, she supports. I've seen a fight for people in uh, 2015. Uh, there were uh, students from universities who had been suspended, I think, from uh, Kisi University and uh, Puani, and uh, she went to court and fought for them until they were reinstated. So this is a very good, she will re be remembered for standing with the, with the, with the uh, poor and uh, those who are being oppressed. In this case, I really believe that if the president or the government, the executive I mean in this case, 
would work hand in hand with the go governor Sonko, things would be better in Nairobi. We don't need this kind of wars. I mean, sometimes we even wonder, is it that the president has failed to govern? You see, even the counties are going to shut down. There are a lot of issues, Linda, that uh, uh, presidential advisors need to sit down and advise him in the proper way. Mm -hmm. All right, so that aside, as we wait to see what uh, will happen in regards to the same, and uh, the revenue share still made, that is the revenue share at the level of the counties, still made is still on, though there is some sigh of relief or a sigh, you know, a uh, beam of hope as Uhuru and Raila and the revenue sharing still made that divided the Senate for months. How do they intend to end it? They promised 54 million shillings more. That is according to how the uh, economy will perform. And uh, this, of course, was a meeting that was held yesterday at State House. And later on, of course, there was that Kamkunji session where the discussion on the revenue share still made was, uh, you know, expounded some more. And this is likely to bring hope. Of course, this was not reached on yesterday. But then again, as many would look at, maybe finally this is going to answer the questions or maybe ensure that it brings in a truce as to how monies are going to, to be disseminated or distributed across different uh, counties. But still, even as this goes on, it is evident that the counties are on their knees and things are not so easy. So coming to you, Kevin Obegi, what do you make of uh, this uh, you know, occurrence that we've been treated to for the longest of time? And indeed, are there likelihoods that this is going to be addressed with what President Uru Kenyatta proposed, noting that it is on uh, you know, how best the economy would perform? Okay, uh, Linda, we, we are not sure if at all we'll have a positive uh, conclusion on this uh, matter. But you see, one would ask themselves, uh, what is really happening in the country? Like now the meeting that they had just yesterday yeah, at State House with Raila, actually, Ruto is supposed to be chairing that intergovernmental budget and economic council with the governors. But he was at line. He was missing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it means there's some hidden agenda, you know, that the public is being drawn away from that it, they are being hidden, yeah, that it's being hidden, you know. So someone has the, is pushing for their own agenda at the end of the day at the compromise of other individuals. So I, I don't think even if they add the 50 plus billion, uh, billion uh, on the, that is the 2021 uh, fiscal year, it means the common one inch is going to dig deeper again, you know, uh, in their pockets to ensure that this is uh, Put to place, but of course it's also a promise that it's on. Uh, you know, if at all we, the government or rather the economy performs well, and we've seen how COVID has really uh, uh, disoriented, you know, our economy and you know businesses are not working here and there. So I think it's still a matter that we we'll look. We're looking forward to see how it will be put into place. All right, and uh, we drop that one, cross over to uh, what is captured on the Daily Nation in the best interest of time. Uh, still on the same, the 50 billion cash deal charms senators. Yes, it's billion, not million, as I said earlier on. This is said to be topped up to the deal that we are talking about. Pledge to push for additional funding will ensure that no county loses out. And uh, it took President Kenyatta and ODM leader Raila Odinga to go with the eyes and provide a way forward on the county revenue allocation formula. And you know, we've spoken about this and we asked whether indeed it needed the intervention of the key leaders. But as it is, many would have argued no. But from what we see today, it's evident that this is certainly what was needed. And what are the likelihoods that this is going to be addressed? Noting that even before, there's been an issue on how much the counties should receive. The 316 billion shillings being disputed by many and eventually was pushed down the throats of the uh, governors and they had to accept that. So what are the likelihoods, one, that the, perf uh, the, the performance of the economy will be perfect enough to guarantee the counties this more money that the president has uh, promised? Uh, first of all, I agree with Kevin that uh, uh, there is a hidden agenda because uh, in the first place, I don't believe that uh, 
the president uh, was supposed to come into to meddle into these issues. These are issues that uh, were supposed to be uh, sorted out by senators, but because the executive tried to interfere with the, uh, the motion in uh, Senate, I think uh, that is the 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 the, 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 the the beginning, the genesis of the whole issue. So I, I, I really believe, and I'm still insisting, and I've always insisted uh, in uh, this show and others, uh, that the executive should keep off. I mean, there are very competent senators there who can even lead this country in a very beautiful way. So let the executive don't feel that they own this country more and uh, that only their decisions should uh, sail through. Uh, this is a matter that was supposed to be uh, debated in Senate, and uh, once, uh, if, if, if the motion didn't pass, I mean, there, there are other ways that uh, the senators could engage. I mean, these are, these are very uh, good leaders. They are very good leaders in Senate, whom we shouldn't doubt. And even the issue of uh, the deputy president being sublined in a committee that really should be sitting, it raises a lot of uh, questions. Mm -hmm. It raises a lot of questions. Yeah. All right, we drop that one and we wait to see what direction it will take. And still on the front page of the Daily Nation, and uh, rising numbers for Mombasa to kind of cause uh, for worry. Like we had said earlier on, the Ministry of Health says that we're not yet there just yet. Uh, double pain. The MES deal was a rip off. Now equipment lives idle at County Hospital. This is in regards to matters and the discrepancies that we've been witnessing over the years within the health docket. And uh, the 21 days ultimatum by President Uhuru Kenyatta to the investigative bodies uh, who are set to investigate the Kemsa scandal is over and done. What do you expect as we get to wind up on uh, this session, Kevin? I think uh, we expect a very progressive uh, report or other feedback report, you know, that will have uh, what was really missing, who did what and what here and there and uh but of course uh you know it's kenya it's kenya for you uh, you know you you can't really tell what is going wrong even if we we we've been given what uh, is missing by the media of course so i think uh, it's also good to put uh, to book uh, the individuals who are uh, perpetrated offenses, especially when you talk about uh, uh, finances missing that are supposed to be for, for the public, you know, like you know, like embezzlement of public funds. I, I think uh, we're really hoping for a progressive one, uh, but of course, we can't do away with the fact that it's Kenya. Right, and yes, what are your expectations, um, Frank? Yeah, I think the. The editor in chief is in uh, is 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 uh, I mean this is the time we need to see this is the first job uh, she's uh, executing and we'll get her from that we are just waiting and we just want to see whether the auditor general will be able to do uh, Oko tried so we are just waiting for this one I totally honest I honestly this is Kenya as Kevin is saying.
and to develop it and coming out big time. <clears throat> And uh, when you talk about a referendum, Gloria, just allow me to ask this one. Um, when you talk about a referendum, uh, that is ultimately a change of governance system. Do you suppose then that the BBI will, they, will be a sure bet for WIPA getting itself you know, to the topmost position? We have no doubt. I mean, uh, we have no doubt about that. Uh, All right. Okay, well, uh, let's look in Gloria and get to hear what she has to say about what WIPA has treated us to and the numerous campaigns that we were treated to over the weekend. And even, you know, throughout the week, we've seen our politicians out there hitting the ground rolling. And like Honorable Farah Malim say, that WIPA is also gearing itself up to go out there to, first of all, try and coerce the people to back the BBI and importantly, also to chart the way forward for the party. What do you make of these political occurrences, even as we deal with COVID-19 in the country? I think the bell has run, and uh, <laughs> there was a lot of wait and see from the different political parties. And then when the realization came that uh, some politicians are gaining ground, I think uh, the, the, the other parties decided, well, we might as well start our campaigns. Um, you know, I can't say that um, it's unfortunate we are focusing on politics as opposed to the economic um, recovery, because politics... Uh, everything is politics. Economic recovery rotates around politics. We, we, um, we might I mean, want to overlook the economic uh, recovery aspect, uh, Gloria, and look at the health Ooh. aspect. Uh, yesterday, the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Health also declaring that we are not yet off the hook and we should not celebrate early. And one of the key reasons they say uh, that uh, could inform this is the fact that uh, people have loosened up on the restrictions that were given on board. So when we see these campaigns being held, when we see politi politicians, you know, out there and congregating people, I mean, uh, overlooking what uh, are the set guidelines for, you know, us be trying to limit COVID-19 in the country, what does it speak? Let's first of all overlook the economic factor. I think the difference here is that um, we, we, we as a government actually did not look into a resiliency plan that allows for business continuity. So for how long will you tell people to stay in their homes and you're not really providing a substantial economic relief? So in terms of um, the health, uh, you know, beating the pandemic, we are going to have life after COVID-19. And I'm really uh, hoping that the government starts realizing that and uh, goes above and beyond um, giving us restrictions. Actually, if you ask me, um, yesterday I saw that the artist, uh, that the acting CEO of the Kenya Cultural Center is now encouraging thespians to go online. And I asked myself, is this really sustainable? Do we understand business continuity post COVID-19? The regulations and restrictions that uh, our government should be putting must has to at least be contextual to a level that we must continue with uh, uh, operations. So whether that means um, we look into ways on if you're gathering two, three, or a hundred or a million people, what then are the restrictions you put? But you can't look at it as uh, you cannot gather. That's, that's where, for me, it feels like we are still stuck on the restrictions without looking at it from a business continuity uh, perspective. Honorable Farah Malik, this then puts to question the genuineness of our leaders on how they handled matters COVID-19 in the country. It is pretty much hard to rule out that factor where, you know, they were not genuine in the first place looking at Tanzania, which is one country that we kept on referring to and the scenario that we have in the country right now that you know right from the first time when the first case was declared then we took these restrictions pretty much fast and then months down the line we still have cases higher than what it was the first time and now we want to take a reverse aspect on how we've handled this is it really uh, is it really logic well, I think, uh, look, uh, nobody nobody has uh, a silver bullet for the way to handle uh, COVID-19, I right. can assure you. The, the top countries, the most advanced countries in the world are lost. We probably seem to be doing better than them. You know, as a matter of fact, we've been doing better than the U.S. and we've been doing better than a number of countries in Europe also. Uh, so so uh, uh, we, 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 we're basically groping in the dark, uh, just firing in the in the dark and hoping that we will 
we will we will we will strike uh, the right the right solution to that problem of COVID. But uh, others come. I couldn't agree more with Gloria. We cannot. This country cannot close. In the way things are right now, okay, I do understand. There's a need for us to make sure that uh, the place, the revelers places, the bars, and all this, uh, the discos, and that kind okay, that part of our life must must be put on some kind of a hold for for a while. But the rest of it, people need to work. People need to earn a living, and, and, and Kenyans are suffering like hell. The economy is doing probably about 60% of what it was optimally, maybe even less. And, uh, you know, it's, people are suffering because of, um, you, would you rather starve to death or would you rather die of COVID? And many people will tell you, I'd rather die of COVID. Maybe I'll find a way to, uh, to deal with it. I was in Gariza a couple of weeks back, and uh, to my utter shock, uh, uh, there's nothing being practiced. There's no social distance. Uh, the mosques are packed. Uh, <laughs> the gatherings, uh, weddings, and everything else, and political gatherings are packed. And then and, and nobody, nobody, hardly anybody is using uh, the, the the masks. But at the same time, the, the numbers are not that high. So mm-hmm. what is it exactly? What, what is it that we don't know? Uh, is it the hard immunity that's uh, taken place, like in uh, countries like Tanzania and Somalia and the rest of them, and the people basically, uh, the thing has come in and the day is, is, is left, or is it is it is it waiting to explode? I don't know, frankly, I don't know. But but uh, I've also seen many people who became sick, who had uh, <coughs> uh, conditions, uh, post-COVID conditions, uh, diabetes, blood pressure, and the rest of them. And who did not go to hospital, <laughs> got an oxygen cylinder, an oxygen regulator. Right. And, and, and an oxygen, what do you call it, a saturation uh, test, the small thing that you put in your thumb. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, to, and some of them are my relatives, and they came out of it very fast. They were positive initially, and they t- tested negative uh, because they, they used the, the simple, the simple, uh, you know, using ginger, lemon, mm-hmm. hot lemon. Mm-hmm. Basically, they, they did all that, and and uh, getting the fumes into their system also, and, and 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 literally living the way we ordinarily in the past used to deal with cold, right. what you call common, which which I I probably get myself once every for ten years, or, and when I get it for a few days, I, I go into a serious crisis. But that's the only way to deal with it. So so um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know, frankly, I. <laughs> I, I and yes, indeed, it's. Uh huh. Well, it certainly I mean, is. I, I cut you short. Yes, yes. I had a lot of uh, compliments and credit for the folks who are dealing with this uh, problem of ours, uh, which is the, the minister and his team, his CSS and the lady and the guy and the man, uh, Mongangi and, and Aman. Uh, they, they've done a good job, undoubtedly. They rose up to the occasion. Mm-hmm. But again, when we when we hear about all these monies that are lost, mm-hmm. when we hear about the fact that uh, uh, extensive, you know, uh, total uh, testing was not done, and we're not, we're not, and we're just basically testing a few targeted groups, uh, then you don't know. You probably think that all this time, when we were g- declaring the numbers, we probably had millions who had the condition, but were getting out of it. Some of them are symptomatic, mm-hmm. and, and many of them. Uh, they did not, uh, did not what you call, uh, need to have any medications. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's possible. We've had over uh, you know, a couple of million people who got uh, infected and who have come out of it now. All right. So, and, uh, which means as we keep uh, celebrating or we acknowledge the job that the Ministry of Health has done in regards to the same, they are squarely the key people who are determinant factors on whether we proceed to reopen all the activities in the country or not. The education sector itself, at you know, at that point where you know it's still not so clear as to whether we need to have our students back to school or not. So, um, coming to you, Gloria, and uh, looking at what the Ministry of Health declared as of yesterday, they are the specialists, they are the gurus on this. They have been the determinant factor right from day one as to the closing down, the reopening, and, you know, the fact of balancing between life and the economy. And here we are today arguing that there is a necessity of us to proceed and have activities resuming back to normalcy, at least in as much as we acknowledge that the virus is here longer with us. So what next for the country within this Akash 22 situation? What next?
next for the education sector? What is next for the tourism sector and all these other sectors that squarely look at the situation and argue that, you know what, if we do not reopen, it's going to be worse? I think uh, what the Ministry of Health should have done, what I feel the Ministry of Health could have done better is they would have brought, brought um, um, experts from the different uh, industries. For instance, you get the experts from um, from the entertainment industries who understand really what's happening in that sector in terms of bars and discos and public gatherings of entertainment. They could have then worked with the, the education experts, like a committee that actually brings to the table an understanding of how to continue with business post-COVID-19. Um, there's, a, there's a very... Um, I would say it's, it's a foolish assumption that, uh, that these industries, the entertainment industry, the arts and culture industry, the sports industry, it's a foolish assumption for anyone to think that those can be put on hold. Those can be cancelled until further notice. Let's open education. Let's open uh, um, these other industries that are perceived to be more important than the others. Um, the livelihoods of a uh, majority of the youth are actually driven from the service industry, which cuts ac across through the tourism and through um, entertainment industry. Mm. So um, when they're saying that, you know, let's open the churches for 100 people and not open the bars. Let's serve alcohol for certain uh, hotels in tourism, uh, and you have to be a resident of that hotel, but we can't serve alcohol for the restaurants, which where you're going in for lunch or, or dinner. I mean, I'm, I've, I've been really trying to understand the, the ideology or the thinking behind it. It does not make much sense mm -hmm. um, from a youth perspective or from also an arts and culture um, uh, enthusiast and, and, and expert, I feel as though where we are failing is we are not looking at business continuity in all fronts um, from a perspective that all these industries must be open, they must um, continue to operate um, within restrictions but uh, in the norm that they should be. For instance, the curfew the curfew that we have that uh, cuts all businesses that are not essential services at nine o'clock, that curfew has affected a majority of the night shift workers who used to work in the service industry, who are either in transport or all these various uh, places. So there has to be a holistic look yeah. when you're looking yeah. to open uh, the economy. And I think this should have already been done yesterday because... Um, we, 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 are, we, are, we, are, we are pushing, we are, we are almost hibernating and pushing something that we are eventually have to, we eventually have to deal with this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even as they start waiting for the green light for most of the sectors to reopen, Honorable Farah Malim, there are still conflicting mm -hmm. messages in regards to what is happening in the country. I mean, at one point we're being told the, uh, the, the curve is flattening. At the other point, the Ministry of Health dis disputes that. I mean, who could be selling this narrative and what could be their main interest? Is it a political interest uh, looking at what has been happening in matters politics and the fact that we acknowledge that there are leaders who say, you know, Reagan needs to come back? Or could it be the people who are minting money from what has been purported are done with the minting process and now they think it's time that we can now get Kenyans back to activity? What just is happening? Well, it's difficult to... to to judge on people's intentions is a bit difficult to judge on that. But the reality of the matter is that all that you have mentioned is happening. I mean, there is there is a few people who are minting a lot of money out of this uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, there is politics in the country which has to continue. There is, a, I mean, everything is there. People need to life needs to continue. We need to we need to 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 work uh, so that the economy is. Uh, is protected, so so it's it's all it's all in one. It's all there's, there's nothing. I mean, uh, everything basically you've mentioned right now is happening. Uh, as of what Gloria said about the service industry and the rest, I think there is a, there are exceptions to the rule. If you're in the service industry, you are given you are given uh, the, the, the the right for you to be moving up and about at cafe time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if being exercised right across the body into the very small mama and boga and people who have small restaurants, you know, back in the, in the, in everywhere in the country or in the city. 
but uh, the implementation is, is 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 one thing we can debate about. But the policy is there to have that exception to those people in those essential services. Uh, the, the reality of the matter is that look, nobody has an answer to our problem, and I think that earlier we we go something closer to the Tanzanian Tanzanian decision, the better. Because mm-hmm. uh, uh, in Tanzania, I mean, they they've just decided no, this thing. Is, is, is as much political as it is health. And they have decided to come out into the open and they are everywhere. I'm sure many, many of the people have gone through these problems. Mm-hmm. But they're beginning to cope with it. It is a coping mechanism. Uh, a disease, once you have uh, a disease, uh, over a period of time, people learn to live with it. And we didn't have all these antibiotics and all these things even in the past. I'm talking about 100, 150 years back. But people still found a way to live with the, with the scorches and the plagues that were there at the time. Mm-hmm. And I don't think this is such a serious plague because I know what's happening in places like Garissa, which is Mandera, which are part of Kenya, where people don't care about social distance. They most of the open, the the weddings and and ceremonies are there all the time, uh, and and I, and <laughs> and there are no cases. I mean, there are very few cases, extremely mm-hmm. limited number of cases. In the case of one person, a foreigner who came in through Somalia, was arrested and put in in prison, in prison. and he ended up. With Infecting prisoners there. Mm-hmm. That was one time when there, were, there was a spike in the numbers. But ordinarily, I mean, they, people are doing well. So you 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 begin wondering where do we need to stop to to be able to to, to, to move forward. I mean, in life you can't stop life. Mm-hmm. And stop now, life. speaking of which, then the recovery plan, economic recovery plan, is a crucial at this particular point. And uh, many have argued that, you know, there needs to be proper uh, proceedings and policies put on board towards recovery of the economy. There is that acknowledgement that globally it might take you no know, longer than expected for us to get at least where we were initially up until 2024. Most of the global uh, fraternity or most of the countries within the global fraternity would not be able to have reached that. So do you suppose then as a country, Gloria, that, uh, you know, the conversations that have been ongoing are good enough to guarantee Kenyans of a proper chart towards the recovery of the economy? I don't think we've had conversations about the uh, the recovery of the economy. We've had conversations about restrictions and we've had conversations about uh, reopening the education sector. Committees have been set up on the recovery plan. They were set up as alias, you know. And, and and they've been set up, but nothing has really been tabled. What have they been working on? Um, as a matter of fact, um, I think I feel as though the private sector has actually indulged themselves more in terms of economic recovery than than than, than our government. You see, some um, the, the banking sector, for instance, or even. Um, the the financial uh, sector you see some of these people coming up with products in terms of loans in terms of sustainability of small uh, businesses but i've had nothing from government in terms of economic recovery in fact as a matter of fact i've been really waiting for politicians other politicians are giving out and come to the table and uh, and say okay instead of just making this a one-time affair for a specific uh, group of people can we then look at how we are going to inject the economy with some sort of capital through a sustainable way of giving handouts mm-hmm. that's what mm-hmm. i've been expecting government to do but instead um, we hear government officials and politicians castigating and saying you know it's wrong for you to go and um empower the youth sector by 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 helping them by giving them tanks giving them uh things that they need that they they are not in a position right now to afford so for me economic recovery is the stimulus packages that the government was talking about we should have seen that trickle down to 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 mamamboga to all these um um small scale traders to a point where there would be no need for politicians to then come and give handouts you know mm-hmm. All right, and you right uh, oh. right there, you just fired shots at right Honorable Raila Odinga. So coming to you, Honorable Farah Malim, do you suppose then that handouts that uh, you know the DP no. is uh, presenting to the people, to the hustler nation, really are they justified? Is there a better way that uh, you know this can be approached, Honorable Farah Malim? <laughs> Look, it's 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 understandable. I mean, the DP uh, went into YK ninety two as a very young man, still in the university. And undoubtedly, he's one of the richest men in the country now. 
and, uh, and nobody knows how he's made all that money. And all the politicians, including the ones who are castigating him, are very wealthy. And everybody knows that they didn't make the money by, you know, selling uh, uh, restaurants or having chains or having a revolutionary, innovative uh, IT uh, ideas. I mean, this is this is the difference between the two is that you know I, I remember a friend of mine way back when way way many years back was accosted by 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 thugs in Nairobi. They yeah. emptied his pocket. Uh, they emptied his pockets. He gave them everything. Fortunately, they did not uh, beat him or do anything uh, any harmful or injury on him. <clears throat> but when he was when he left, they told him, "Okay, go and don't look back mm-hmm. because they didn't want them to see." Yes. And one of them told him, no, 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 come back. And he gave back 100 shins. I told him, where do you live? I live in uh, Sli. Mm-hmm. He said, you need to get back to Sli and take a taxi. Those days, taxes would go for, you know, less than 100 shins. Right. So he gave him 100 shins. Mm-hmm. I told him, okay, you use this 100 shins. You can say, I could make you to go here and at least get home. Mm-hmm. And next time, uh, uh, don't make sure you don't walk around here without money. Because when we get you and we don't find money on you, we'll beat mm-hmm. you up. So that's, that's, you know, when you see a politician going out there and giving out some small amounts of money to people, a couple of million, or a couple of hundred thousand, it's just like that very generous, what he called a thug, mm-hmm. who called back the man he just robbed and told him, take this hundred shins and go home and, and make sure you, you know, you keep the cow uh, uh, with milk always when we get you. Yeah. And essentially, uh, support me because of that. Get me back into office. I can rob you even more. I can still bring you a little bit of goodies here. But then who is better? The one who gives them a little bit of goodies <laughs> to go back home? Oh, really? Yeah, or, the one who, or the one who takes everything and gives them nothing back? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, well, the one who is giving out, the ones who are, I mean, people who are out there, politicians also castigating it, there's nobody who is just on Kenya, I can assure you, and they all there for their own. Uh, Gl- Gloria I'm seems glad. not to agree yeah, with I, you. If I, could engage I think in that's. This. I think it's a it's a very misleading narrative um. because <laughs> if you're going to say that about a politician who chooses to practice uh, responsible uh, giving back to the community, mm-hmm. and you're going to call that politician a tag, and without any substantial uh, evidence that that money was indeed stolen, then are we also going to go to the civil society who actually rely on uh, donor funding? Are you going to say that their their handouts as well is a uh, uh, is a res- uh, as a result of the corporate uh, uh, thieving that is going on. Are you also going to go back to people like um, societies such as the Kenya Red Cross Society? We know that, that they rely on, on donor funding. Mm-hmm. We know that they rely on... on um, uh, on, on, on out of goodwill, financial uh, uh, donors who maybe have sat somewhere and they are passionate about um, uh, healthcare or they are passionate about uplifting the lives of those who are unable to afford certain basic standards of living. Are you also going to call them thugs? I mean, if you're going to say that um, any person who is seen to be uh, giving back to society, whether financially or through other resources, if we're going to call them thugs, is that the culture we are trying to push that once you get there and once you're capable of sustaining yourself you should forget about where you've come from you should forget about the less fortunate you should forget about um assisting anyone around you because that is not our culture as african people and it's not our culture but, but 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 Father Malim argues that you know he, he this person who steals and at least shares with the people is even better off in comparison to the other one who steals and literally does not give the people nothing that's his argument that is so, not that's <laughs> That is not that is not that is strictly not what I'm I'm pushing for because to first of all say a person that steals and then gives back is better than a person who steals and doesn't give back. It is like we have accepted the illness of the, of, of any society. For you to say that um uh, any any donor or any politician or any uh, organization that is giving back to the society is automatically a thug. That's very lazy thinking. Mm-hmm. That's that's absolute. That's like saying um, that the first lady, when she's coming with her initiative of of of, uh, of the healthcare of, uh, of what is that work that they always do every year? Yeah, Can we also say that? Yeah. Can we also say that she's an equivalent of a thug? Well, I mean, Honorable Farah Malim, Honorable Farah Malim, uh, back to you. You know, you know, one of, you know, one of the reasons why I I don't see that much future for our country is that, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, mm-hmm. there is a, a culture and a creed that has come out. When you see young people who have gone to universities and who are well educated, and who protect some of these things, 
and and and, and basically are, are out there to drum to drum support for mm -hmm. politicians. I'm a politician myself. For politicians who did not have, you know, let me let me tell you one thing. Trump is a is a is a developer. Right. He builds properties. He builds the highest, the tallest, what you call uh, 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 buildings in the in, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the tallest buildings in the states. But and and, and the, the Kennedy family were in the in what you call they were in Wall Street. They were there in in, uh, in in shares and all those things. Their father, the senior Kennedy, did a lot. Yeah. Uh, but then if you talk of somebody like Jimmy Carter, who was a peanut farmer, mm -hmm. everybody knows how much a peanut peanut farmer can make. Yeah. Can I ask you what you know exactly the current top politicians who are very wealthy, mm -hmm. whether they had some neighbors or Nakumas, or what, what is it that the change that brought them that money? You just don't come from school straight away. Right. Get involved in a political in a political bandwagon called, called YK92 that got us into the mess we were in right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she was very young, Gloria. I must have been in primary school that time if she was around, maybe even younger than that. And and then uh, well, you know he's out there distributing millions and millions. The issue is where did you get this money from? Right. Now don't tell me you know where he got. Don't ask me and tell me. Uh, you give me the proof that he made this money. Uh, give me the proof of how the money was made. This is this is a simple logic and narrative in the world over mm -hmm. in all the development. Just when you have that's why they call of something talk of something called money laundering. When people make a lot of money from drugs, they will try and launder it somewhere else. And, and that has got to be followed. There are right. agencies, there are departments in the in the in the in the in the, in the criminal in the criminal justice system in all those countries that tracks these things. Now suddenly you tell me I don't want to name names, but look of look at all the richest men who are billionaires in this country, mm -hmm. who were politicians. Where, where did, how did they make it in the first place? And then you want to tell me that oh, but why do you call them? Because they give no look. Red Cross. Is an emergency response uh, institution. It's a global institution. Mm -hmm. We know where they get money from. They get their money from the two percent or the one percent that's given by all the developed world to try and assist the developing world. So that you know, basically, they, they you don't see the kind of pictures you see when people go hungry, and droughts and famines and wars are there. And and this this is kind of a, a, a responsive uh, 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 response. To, to, to the global, where they are very wealthy and they, where they are very poor. But when you come to our own country, look at the countries that we have in the neighborhood here, particularly look at, uh, look at a country like uh, Somalia, Somalia, which is a, which is a failed state. And, and, and when, when the director general or the minister of health decided to steal some little money, he was already serving 19 years. Right. You get my point. All the five of them were arrested, or eight of them, nine of them, I think, and they're all serving long-term jail yeah, terms. And in this country here, you talk of 46 billion, which disappears in thin air, and, and there's a committee, there's parliamentary select committee, there's this, there's that. At the end of the day, it's, it's there. It's, you don't see anything happening. And, and, and speaking of which, Honorable Farah Malim, speaking of which, the 21 days ultimatum that was given by President Uru Kenyatta as to the cancer case is lapsing. What are the likelihoods are that we are going to get anything tangible now that you argue that there are likelihoods that we're not going to get anything? ESCC has been manning midnight oil. Of course, the Auditor General has been called upon to see to it that they address this. What just are the likelihoods that we're going to get answers before we loop in, Gloria? Zero, zero. I can zero. tell you it's happening. It's happened from the time when we got independence in this country and up to this state, let me be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be, fortunately, and uh, uh, very thankfully to my creator, I have been, have, been, have been around for a very long time. And and I was there when, when, when we had the first president and had the first government. And I'm here with you now in the, mm -hmm. in the interview. And, and, and we've seen it all. We've seen it all. There used to be the May scandals. There's a candle. We are paying for external debts right now. Nobody knows who took the money. Money was negotiated outside by international, what they call lenders. We took the money and it ended up in the private pockets of people. At Independence, we had a lot of money that was given so that the Mau Mau fighters and the people who basically did not have any land, to be bought land. That money ended up in the pockets of the wealthy or rather of the powerful that time. They are not wealthy and of course they ended up becoming very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And a, a whole class of, uh, of, of uh, millionaires, the billionaires of the so the point I'm trying to tell you is, look, you can do what Gloria is doing now, and I see a lot of that all over the country, yeah. young people running around trying to support politicians just because they have the means, and the means is undoubtedly, undoubtedly mm -hmm. uh, stolen. If it's not stolen, you see, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, 
in 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 the developed world right in the developed world when you have money you are, you it's more important more difficult you, you have to prove how you made that money yeah. <laughs> you see what i mean you don't make you don't make billions and billions so you don't make a billion dollars in less than when you're less than so you less than your early 50s or you're only 50 years old mm -hmm. and 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 you made it through selling chicken or eggs <laughs> or, or, or hustling as you call hustler you hustling what do you hustle oh. well, they're in politics through and, and when you hustle it not so so sometimes you don't put you don't pull a rug over your face and 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 and, and you, you fail to and this is this is primarily what this country is concerned and I Gloria do not uh, hold because on, Marim, let's bring in Gloria uh, on the same and get her reactions. And uh, Gloria, um, Honorable Farah Malim has been part and parcel of the government. He says he's a politician and you know very well that, like he says, he's been there. And we all at least have been there uh, to witness what has been happening on matters graft. Uh, President Uru Kenyatta on the forefront to say that, you know, his government is going to leave a legacy that will be known for having, you know, successfully dealt with graft in the country. I mean, when you hear utterances coming from crucial leaders that, you know what, we're not going to attain anything, what does it make you feel as a citizen? What does it make you feel as a member of the civil society? I want to first of all clarify that uh, my political affiliation, whether with Tanga Tanga or Kieleweke or mm. anyone, is neither here nor there. I stand for issue-based politics, the issue at hand here, and I'm glad, I'm really glad that finally the older politicians and uh, the senior members of this country are starting to see the youth and the young people coming out, whether they are against the activities of what they're coming out for. At least you're starting to recognize that, as, as he has said, um, he sees a lot of young people coming out to support um, politicians because they have or they don't have or, or whatever that narrative was. I'd like to say this. Uh, there is a disconnect. There is a disconnect between older politicians and the youth generation. There's mm -hmm. a disconnect because they don't really necessarily understand why uh, we are pushing certain agendas and why our advocacy rotates around certain issues. When I hear a politician, a veteran politician, dismissing the youth in terms of saying, um, you know, it's sad that they are going around supporting this or support, instead of understanding why is Gloria supporting this particular uh, uh, an issue so that they can be able to refine their politics? Because um, I'm sorry to say, their politics is completely backward. We are in the new age uh, uh, era where the youth have actually woken up and they are starting to understand what they should be fighting for. And when I was speaking in terms of, of, of uh, um, uh, donations or supporting those who actually go to give back to their communities, I will forever stand for any individual, whether they are the deputy president or the first lady or the, the president or Raila Odinga, I will stand for them when they are doing something that is impactful, positively impactful to the society and particularly to the youth. Gloria, so, Gloria, um, I'm let, me, let me ask this question. Uh, the youth for the longest of time have been accused of presenting, you know, politics of intolerance as opposed to challenging the oldies, you know, with uh, ideologies, with better ways of handling this. And probably this is what has informed this lack of inconsistency and, you know, lack of change and connection uh, between this uh, task, that is uh, the oldies and the new generation. So how best then can we chart the way forward if at all we are to achieve anything from these uh, talks of liberation? Two things is that the youth have never pushed for politics of intolerance. They've actually been used as tools to push uh, violence during political heightened areas. They've been used. The youth have constantly been used. And what is happening now is that they have decided to take charge of their own spaces. And when you see me coming to a show like this, talking and, 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 and clearly articulating that indeed I support certain activities that are going on in, uh, in the political arena, it is because it has come to to my understanding that this is actually impactful 
to the youth. So um, instead of castigating why I support it, perhaps try to understand why do uh, a majority of the youth, uh, why are they falling into this uh, uh, narrative of the of the hustler nation? When you understand that, then you will try and, and engage them and try to push your agenda, whether it is the white party or whether it is ODM. But what I see them doing, I had yesterday... Um, the chair of ODM mm -hmm. body say that, uh, you know, what does it mean? You're going to be you're a presidential candidate and you're going to give tanks and you're going to give a uh, uh, blow dryers or whatever. He really d d downgraded. He, he, he belittled the, the trade with which the youth are actually participating in. You see, to him... I, I, are you uh, trying to say that the DP is uh, indeed selling the narrative and uh, the interest of the youth? I'm trying to say that anyone who's pushing empowerment, sustainable economic empowerment for the youth, who happen to be the majority of the population of this country, right. is definitely going to be appeasing to the youth. So instead uh, Honorable of, instead Malim, of, of, of let's allow Honorable Farah Malim react to that. And what, my question what, then what, would be, are the yeah. old politicians, what, you know, uh, overlooking what it is that the youths are presenting on the table? What is sustainable about giving things worth 200,000 shillings, 300,000, a million shillings in an economy of 3 trillion shillings to a handful of youths? What is sustainable about assisting some 200 or maybe 100 young people here and there when we've got 60? How many, how many do we have? 60% of our world population without work. It looks we like half a loaf is better than one, Mwishimiwa. It looks like half a loaf is better no, than one. Can, can you kindly allow me to can answer that question? Can I finish, Gloria? It's a millionth, not, not a half a loaf. What are you talking about, half a loaf? Half a loaf is if somebody is going to distribute. And then we don't want a hands, a, a, you know, we don't want people to not be happy with handouts. These are handouts. What are the programs and the policies and the areas where the, there is a multiplication or the, 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 the changing of the lives of the youths? What we want to see is somebody, and in any case, let me tell you, we want to see somebody who says, look, I'm going to put in 100 million students into this place here. And it's going to change the lives of, um, you know, half a million Kenyans. We will have to irrigate this land. We'll do ABCB. But walking around with a little bags of money here and there and giving it to, and, you know, walk into a kiosk and then you have a cup of tea just to look simple there, uh, with a, with a, with a lady. And I'm sure this is all pretty time. The cups must have been washed very well and taking some chapati with them and calling yourself a hustler and walking out there and giving that hundred thousand to the lady who then jumps up and down. You think that is giving back to the youth? That and the youth accept, uh, uh, you know, Can some you of them appreciate this. Not, not, only accept, not, not, only, not only do they accept, they are foot soldiers for it right now. All I, the I, education, I, can I finish, I, Gloria? Can I finish? All the education, all that they have gone through, all the future being stolen in their face. The president, the deputy president was talking of a double digit, what you call growth in our economy. The creation of 500,000 jobs. Where did they go? COVID only came last year. Late last year, it's only eight months, nine months, but two years before that. What happened to the stadiums? What happened to all those stories you have been given? And now you, you, you think by somebody walking around and saying, I'm a hustler, I made this money by selling chicken and, and those things. And in any case, if it's a corporate social responsibility, it's a common thing. By the way, in any developed world, you cannot walk into a place and give out money without showing where it came from. Corporate social responsibility basically means that you have a corporation, if he has a company, and the company is giving back to the society because of the business that's made, the profits that's made. That's understandable. But a politician walking around with bags of money, where did this money come from? Gloria, do you know where it came from? Don't ask me whether I, I know where, where it came from myself and that's the reason why. No. When you have money that is unusual, that is being given out, somebody has got to be able to give, you should say, this is my salary for the last two months. Take it. We'll understand it. Mm -hmm. This is my, my business, which is called whatever, whatever, insurance company or anything else, or which has declared profit that were worth 10 billion, 20 billion, so I'm giving back 1 billion to the country back again. That's those kinds of understandable. Where is this money coming from? This small, small bits and pieces that seems to be buying the young people and they're jumping up and down to the extent of even trying and defend their right now on, on the mainstream media. <laughs> Where is it from? All right, let's allow Gloria this point. Uh, Uh, fortunately, I have uh, many answers. One, does giving a tank actually benefit 
giving a few millions, does it benefit? There's something called social enterprises. Social enterprises are actually there for a particular reason. It is such that you encourage an entrepreneur to create a business that is able to employ two, three, or four people, and after a period of time, you engage them in scaling up that operation. When you see a person, whether the deputy president or whether you see uh, Gladys Wanga or whoever giving out a tank, saying this is going to a car wash. It is not just a tank. It's not just a symbol of, of my, 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 my stolen, so to speak, funds that I'm injecting into the economy. What it is, it's capital. You have actually empowered a, a youth out there to start a business which essentially will create jobs. I want to give statistics of the youth and the unemployment. 75% of our population falls under the youth sector. Our population is about 50 million. So if you do the numbers, we are talking about 37 million are youth. Every year, 500,000 of these youth go through universities, technical, vocational, educational trainings, they graduate. What happens to them? They come out to this public uh, space and there are no jobs. There are simply no jobs. So what you're seeing in the social enterprise space is an initiative to create businesses that are actually going to create jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, one car wash employs at least five people. So are we going to say that these five jobs does not have any impact on the 500,000 graduates that are coming out? Are you uh, going Gloria, to say Gloria, that this, my uh, Gloria, the no argument again allowed. then would be, someone is asking, this is a person who wears two caps. One is standing as a 2022 presidential contender, but equally is part and parcel of the government. Why is it that these moves are not being pushed as the government of the day, but on individual basis? Can, can I, can I, I, Gloria, I, I can I add something, Gloria, so that you can, you can just get it. Now, if that, no, 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 you'll, give, you'll have your moment. Listen, yeah. if that was coming from an ordinary shop owner who is out there, who has got a small hardware shop, and every six months he comes with about half a million shillings and says, I'm going to build this, I'll help him. Understandable, that is a fantastic thing, altruism. But you're telling me, with, the, with, with 35 million young people, half a million getting all every year added into the, and no jobs, the person who promised to give half a million jobs every year and who is the vice deputy president of this country can go around and give a few tanks there and a few, you know, here and there. And then you are happy with that. That is the man who is holding. That's the man who is holding the past of this country. That is the regime. These are the people who are supposed to create that. And they're able to, for lack of a better one, bribe you or bribe the youth with, with a few tanks here and a few car wash there. Something is serious and wrong. I, I can't, I can't, I and I don't, I don't, I don't fault you because that seems to be with the idea with many young people I've seen. They're just happy that they can go around. Anyway, go on and tell me what you think. <laughs> you, uh, know, you know, you uh, know, you know what I'm. As seeing, we wind up on that one, Gloria. Yeah, there are a lot of questions that are being asked, but I'm not being given time to respond. He asked about what does one water tank do to the, and I explained it in terms of social enterprises. And I was trying to make him understand that the business that we have as uh, the civil society and as community-based organizations is to create jobs because we understand that we have a majority of the youth that are not em employed. And it's not because there are so many jobs out here and the youth don't want to be, it's because there are no jobs. So when I see initiatives that are actually pushing for job creation, my business is to encourage that. And by the way, I do not speak on behalf five of Tanga Tanga. Tanga. No, no, no. no. I don't speak. Five jobs. I don't speak. I, I do, I'm not in government. I do not speak on behalf of, of, of the government of Kenya. I, I have tried to get in government so that I can be able to push for that policy creation and for, for those kind of things that he's talking about. But I'm not there. And I, I do not know why it is completely impossible for the deputy governor to push but, that same agenda within government because I'm not in government and I'm not his spokesperson. But when I see him, oh, when oh, I see right. him doing something oh, that yeah. is pushing my agenda, the youth agenda, then I better support it. All right. So you this, again, the attend, question. Attend, attend by the president or deputy president of this country, and you call somebody who's pushing something for the use of the end that is why they see there's something wrong with this country. I, it's a pity. I keep on self-pitying ourselves. Gloria, you've gone to school, and I bet you are very well educated. And you say, I have to appreciate the fact that the deputy president has taken five times somewhere, each one of them costing maybe about 60,000 shillings, and you think that is good when he has I promised you a million dollars? When he promised you half a million dollars? 
All right. I assure Hold you. I assure, no, no, no. I want to assure him. I want to assure him that if he brings two or three turns in the problems that I am advocating for in the community, I will appreciate him the same way. No one is stopping you we, from we actually do, going do to push the youth agenda. Gloria, I'll appreciate you the same way. Uh, Gloria, Gloria, initially, you had, you, you had, you had lauded the importance. Can, can I assure you one thing? I do that every day, and I do it, and I don't talk about it. And okay. I do it for my small businesses, small, small businesses. It takes we me appreciate a, a you. Years. Yes, but that, that we appreciate be, you, and, and I don't, we have, appreciate I don't you have a government job, and I don't do any government conference. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's hold it right there. Let's hold it right there. I mean, it has queued uh, the time for the other conversation. And remember, you can be part and parcel of this conversation. 0768095491 at the number to call. The lines are open for you to call in 22047. You can as well drop your comments and we get to sample them as we proceed. As we drop on this particular subject, the revenue share still meet. And, uh, I, well, just, just. But in, just about in. I only have 10 more minutes myself. If it's I'm okay, yes, we only have 10 more minutes. That's yeah. why I'm saying we cannot go without without talking about the revenue <laughs> share still made at the levels of the county. What is left of devolution, Honorable Farah Marlin, before we come to glory? I, well, I, I think there's a, there's a serious attack on devolution, a serious, serious attack from the center on devolution. And, uh, and I think uh, Kenyans need to stand up right now. This is only 15% of our ordinary revenue in the country here. And which is divided for between for seven different what you call counties. Mm -hmm. And right now, started. Let me tell you one thing. When we first got independence, we had a, a federalist system in in place. And 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 when the government of the first president came to power, all they did was to stab it all, and it died. The federal government died because there was no revenue that was generated or that was transferred from the center to the periphery. And, and, and in, in complete violation, complete fragrant violation mm -hmm. of the constitution of the country and the rule of law. And the system has enshrined that time in our constitution. Uh, they starved it and that's how they died. The federalism died. The upper house, which was the Senate, was dissolved and it was merged with the National Assembly. And that's how we found it. And that's how we have had it now all these years until the 2010 constitution. Mm -hmm. I can see uh, a total war. A serious onslaught again on devolution uh, by 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 the centre, and, and and basically it's uh, I don't think uh, we are in the, in the state we were in 1963. Uh, today is different, and I'm sure Kenyans are going to resist that with all their might. The Kenyans have seen that although there's a lot of corruption in the periphery, hell of a lot of corruption by the governors and and, and the systems in the in the in the periphery, but nonetheless still. A certain amount of money goes into the what you call the counties and changes the lives of Kenyans. Mm -hmm. So try and take away that from them by the centre itself, which is what is emphasised in this new uh, 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 efforts of the Senate, is in my opinion, uh, in the, to say the least, preposterous. It's very, very bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, and I, I, I pity very much because the history will be written, these facts will come out into the open, and uh, Kenyans are now going to stand up, particularly in the leadership to be counted on who wants to kill devolution and who wants to save devolution. Mm -hmm. And then what are the likelihoods of devolution being a saved, a Gloria, looking at what has been culminating and the standoff? Uh, we've talked about this before. Up until yesterday, there was some bit of you know, white smoke in regards to how this is going to be handled. The President Uhuru Kenyatta, alongside Honorable Raila Odinga, promising counties more $54 billion on top. Uh, that is based on how the economy will perform. What are the likelihoods that the economy will perform so well to a point of guaranteeing them this top up? And what are the likelihoods there? In terms of economy recovery, I mean, um, we have the different sectors that are going to be taken care of, but above and beyond government initiatives. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see what the formula will look like because mm -hmm. my issue particularly was marginalizing areas that have already been historically marginalized in terms of financial. So I want to see how counties like Wajir, how counties within the Asal uh, region are going to benefit from the new formula and whether or not that is actually going to um, help escalate the development 
within those countries because you know um, the Assam region has 89% of the land mass um, of Kenya and um, there was an argument about does um, development follow uh, uh, financial or you know is it the chicken or the egg and I feel as though um, we need to have a substantial amount of development in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economic uh, driven activities in the Asal region in order for us to even push not only for an economic recovery, but also for a boost in the economies of those counties. So I'm really looking to see that um, once this um, formula is initiated when because I've seen that they've stipulated that the formula will be initiated when the monies will be released, released uh, from government. So I want to see how that formula affects um, the Assal region particularly because I feel as though they were the most uh, hard hit when they were going um, against, um, you know, whether it's population or landmass. So if, if that d doesn't change, to me, it will be a little bit strange that we've been fighting for something and eventually the monies are released and still we see those marginalized communities still marginalized. Mm -hmm. All right, Honorable yeah. Farah as we get to wind up in a minute or so, yes? I agree, I agree with Gloria on this. It's a pity, it's a pity. We had a session on paper number 10 of 1965, which basically talked about intensification of the economy, right. putting more money into the areas that were already doing well, and that did very well under the colonial government because these are the high potential areas. The colonial said the coffee farms, the tea farms, and all these big, big. Uh, and those areas were, the, again, what was said by the government, we put more money into it. So the ones which have been stopped through 70 years of colonialism, uh, the, the first Kenyatta regime said, let's stop them. Right. And that's how we ended up. And that uh, session of paper number 10 was only corrected uh, uh, by, 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 by the constitution 2010. And hopefully, by this through the, the revenue sharing formula that was created, uh, consequent to that. As I'm talking to you right now, this is the only place, the only place in the in the in the in the in the country that does not have a tarmac road leading to our borders is the Assal areas. We don't have a tarmac road from the areas of Liboy, which is with the Somalia border. We do not have the uh, uh, tarmac road from Modogashi to Mandela. Right. Which is the, again, Somalia, and the, we just got the one to Ethiopia the other day. So the the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the government has shied away from committing a lot of resources in those areas to stimulate the economy and to open up those areas for for, for development. And now the only time when there was a limited amount of money, which is only fifty percent, and was was shared in a formula that essentially took all that affirmative action into 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 consideration. Right. We have another government, led this time by the son of the first man who, uh, under his reign and under his watch, this was done, this preposterous thing was done to us, or to the people in the last area. And here is he, him now again, under his government, uh, basically trying to push for something like that and saying, take the money from their mouths. You know, take it, bring it back to us and, and they don't deserve it. I mean, this is, this is, those are the blunt words. And here is also, uh, it is a fantastic opportunity for Kenyans to see the real nationalists. To see the superheroes of our own legislative bodies in here in the name of Malala and, and Sakaja and, and all those guys who did such a fantastic job, um, Mutula Kilonza Jr. and stood up, stood up firmly for what was basically a nationalist position. Regardless of Malala Senator Malala's constituency or county uh, stands to gain. But he says, I am not going to take my food out of the mouth of a starving child in Mandera or in Wajir or in Marsabit to feed to my children. I have a duty to share whatever we have with them and to bring them up up to speed with us. We had what yeah. was called uh, uh, an equalization fund. Yeah. Never used, never used. It's unfortunate, it's unfortunate that Uhuru Kenyatta is going to go down in history as a man whose government or his reign or regime has waged a, 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 a war, total war, on parts of the country in terms of trying to marginalize them further and reduce them to some kind of a permanent underclass. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is what intended to have as his legacy uh, on, his, on his last two years in, in office here. But, the, 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 you know, all said and done, be that as it may, the beauty of it is that we have a country and we have Kenyans who care for one another and who have stood up to the moment, exactly like Gloria has done now. And, 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 and these are the kind of uh, basic, uh, basic, what we call uh, nationalistic, patriotic, positions we should all have. We should all have. All right. I, 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 I remember as a young 
itself in Parliament one time. There was there was a position in, in I was in the opposition, the only MP from Northern Kenya at that time doing mm -hmm. the opposition. And my position was, look, is this good for the country? If it's good for every corner of the country, I'm, I have count me on it. If it targets a section of it, let's target Moi as a president those days and try and bring down his regime. But let's not target the Kalijin community because the Kalijins are Kenyans mm -hmm. and they are our brothers and sisters. And, and that basically is, 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 is the manner uh, all of us to be our brothers and our sisters keepers in this country. And this country needs uh, people who exactly uh, do so, like what some senators have done and the position a young lady like Gloria has taken for our future to be secure also. Right. Because when, when you feel left out, then you don't grow up with the good feelings. You you begin looking for how to you know take it back. You know what I mean? And, and that's still not the case in our country. Thank you so much, Honorable Farah Malim. This is a conversation that I you know could take us for another two hours, but because of the time, we might not be able to expand on more on that. Uh, but then again, Gloria, picking up from what Honorable Farah Malim says, indeed, for a moment we've seen a show of national interest, or it was a political interest, as many would have argued as we wind up. Um, I, I think I'm just glad the Kenyans are part participating in a way because. Uh, sorry, keep, yeah, sorry. Keep, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm glad that Kenyans are participating, and I'm excited to see the youth um, trying to plug in and trying to be um, a bit more involved, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the economy. I mean, just the fact that we are having this conversation is a realization that um, as a youth, you have a role to play. And uh, my role is uh, pushing the youth agenda, which I think at the moment is empowerment for the youth in terms of economic sustainability and also political inclusion. So um, for me, I want to end it at um, try to do something. You can complain all day, try to do something or try to support something that is being done by somebody. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that is Gloria Roba, Youth Policy Analyst and Honorable Farah Malin, former Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly. Thank you so much for the great insights this morning and for the numerous feedback. In the interest of time, we might not be able to go through them. But we cross over to a different segment altogether. That is on Matters Lifestyle. And we discuss mental health amid this time of COVID-19 after this short break. Thank you so much.